depths of the sea. It is still the blood of Jesus. Yes, it's still the blood of Jesus. Oh, it's still the blood of Jesus that brings victory to me. All right, grab your hymn book again. Turn to page 393. We'll sing, There Shall Be Showers of Blessing. Page 393. Showers of blessing, this is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing, sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing, come and now honor thy word. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy, <coughs> but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, all oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. There shall be showers of blessing, if we but trust and obey. There shall be seasons refreshing, if we let God have his way. Showers of blessing, mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Or if you'd like to stand together, open your Bibles to James chapter number 5. James chapter number 5. I'm going to read verse number 16 together and then um, look into a few thoughts this evening. Um, James chapter number 5, verse number 16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Father, we ask that you, for your help this evening. I ask that the Holy Spirit would um, please expound on his word and, uh, Lord, that you'd make it very clear to us. Lord, I pray that you'd organize my thoughts and help my speech this evening. Allow me not to be a distraction, but a help. Lord, we're going to give you honor and glory for everything that's done this evening. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So this evening, what I would like to talk about um, are some things that, um, are, that might be hindering our prayer life. Things that are hindering our prayer life. Here in James, we read that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And... Breaking those words down, if you were to look at effectual, um, it's really to, to, have adequate, to, to have adequate power um, or force to produce an effect. The, the effectual fervent, the fervent is a, a great passion, a glowing desire. 
um, of a righteous man availeth. Availeth is to, to ex- exercise that power. Availeth much. And so the question I want to ask ourselves this evening is, does that describe my prayer life? Uh, is my prayer life one that is effectual, fervent, and that avails? And so this evening as we look, walk through the Bible and look at very different, there are several different things that may hinder our prayer life. Some may not apply to you at all, and some, some may. Uh, and so this evening, let's look at ourselves together. Let's, let's examine our own heart and see how can we make our prayer life more effective. Because who doesn't want to have an effective prayer life, right? Like, I, I would assume every person in this room would love to say, I, I would love to have a prayer life when I pray. I know God is listening and that he's going to answer. I, I think that's a fair statement. And so I think it's also fair to search in Scripture and find what would prevent this, okay? So, number one, I, ha- I think I have eight things, eight things. The first thing um, is a lack of salvation, a lack of salvation is going to hinder your prayer life, if you didn't know that. Um, one thing that can, can get under my skin a little bit, and it probably shouldn't, but I don't, patience is something I pray for often. Right? Like, I'm trying to get more patience. But when I, when I hear or see lost people that are, they, they are clearly lost, and they're praying to God, and they're saying, you know, give me a sign, or, you know, heal this person, and I'll do all this stuff, and it's, that's not how it works. Like, you can look all through this book, and you're not going to find that in there. Uh, A saved person is not going to get God's attention through prayer. Uh, the, The only time would be that prayer of salvation. And until that moment happens, Prayer for an unsaved person doesn't exist. Turn over to Psalm 66. We're going to turn in our Bibles a lot this evening. So hopefully your fingers are, are all warmed up. I know it's a little cold in here. Maybe rub your hands together a little bit. Get your, get your joints all loosened up. Psalm 66, verse number 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty basic, and that's pretty direct. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So if you are not saved this evening, you need to be. Not, not just to have a prayer life, but to have a relationship with God, to be reconciled unto him. Nothing would make every person in this church happier if someone were to come forward tonight and say, you know, Pastor Steve, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Everybody would be thrilled. It, I, it wouldn't matter if you've been going to this church for 15 years. Every person would be excited for you. And so never never use that as an excuse. Well, I've been going here for so long, and I'm sure I'm, yeah, I'm, sure I'm fine by now. No. If you can't show me a Bible reason why you know for sure you're on your way to heaven, please come see me. Please come see me after the service. So the first thing, a lack of salvation. The second thing, unrepented, unrepented sin. Kind of going along with a lack of salvation, except obviously now we're saved so we can have that communion, that conversation with God. But unrepented sin is going to hinder those prayers. Turn over to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter number 59. Not only does it hinder your prayers when it comes to God listening, for me, I know in my own personal life, if I have an an unconfessed sin in my life when I go to pray to God, it's just hard to pray. It's hard to pray with any kind of how James described it, fervency, strong desire. I man, when I if I have sin in my life, it it just isn't gonna happen. Now I am not saying that you have to be completely perfect in order to pray. That's not what I'm saying. But I do believe that you need to have un- you need to remove the unconfessed sin from your life. It's just like if you were to take communion. Um, if you look at Isaiah 59, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins 
have hid his face from you that he will not hear. This principle applies to us today as well. Obviously, we understand that Isaiah was writing this specifically to Israelites at the time, but the principle applies. We, we understand that God's characteristics are the same. And so, the Lord will separate himself from iniquity. The, we, we can't get into heaven, right? If we have sin in our life, we, we, if, we, if we have unconfessed sin, we have not been saved, we can't get into heaven because iniquity separates us from God. I mean, that we read that in Romans, we read that in Corinthians, that that's all throughout the Bible, that, that policy, if you will, of your sin is going to separate you from God. And so when it comes to your prayer life, that, that same principle exists when you're trying to have an effectual, fervent prayer. 1 John 3.22 says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. God prefers it when we are good, I promise you. Um, so often today we hear about this easy, easy believism, right? To where, you know, just name it and claim it and you're saved and then live life as you want. God prefers you to do right. Um, you know, the, the song that we sing in family school, you know, um, what shall I say? So I continue, I had to sing it a little bit, sorry. So I continue in sin that grace may abound, God forbid. That is, not, that is not how a Christian's life is designed to work. That's not how our prayer life is designed to work. So first, a lack of salvation. Second, an unrepented sins. Uh, third, wavering faith. Wavering faith will hinder your prayer life. Turn back over to James chapter number one. James chapter number one. I know it's in my Bible. We were just there. James chapter number one, verse number five says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Driven with the wind and tossed. That's how it describes a person that prays without faith. Without faith. Um, so, I've heard a lot of people pray over the years. And I, I love, it's funny because we'll get to a point later on. I don't really like praying out loud. I know that sounds funny, right? But I, you know, like you're an assistant pastor. Like, I just don't, I don't like doing it. I'd much rather be in, in a closet by myself praying there than talking in front of you people. <laughs> Y'all scare me a little bit. And so, no, but I, I love when I hear people pray and you can tell it's just, it's just so genuine. It's just, you can tell when they pray, they're, they're just asking. You know, like, like you were talking uh, last week, he's just talking to God. And that person, when they're praying, they're praying with faith. Uh, they're, they're praying with the confidence that I am talking to the creator of the universe, the savior of my soul, the one that died on the cross for my sins, the one that is there for eternity, the one that's been, uh, the, you know, forever past. For, like, they're confident in who they're talking to. But as we've been saved for so long, I feel like we can, we can lose some of that, especially when we're playing in front of people. You know, we, can, we can get in this mentality because the fact is you want to, like, you, you want to sound polished, you know, use correct grammar. You, you want to make sure you say words that make sense and don't make them up in your prayers. You know, if I do that when I'm praying by myself, you know, Lord and I just laugh about it a little bit. <laughs> but in front of people, it's a little different. But when that person's praying, that's unpolished. That's, that's a blessing to me. Just, just to hear the faith in their voice is, is a blessing. Um, if you look back at the verse number five, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Now, in this chapter, we understand this is talking about wisdom uh, when it comes to temptation, right? This whole chapter is about temptation when it comes to the context. But if any of you let, let him, or lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. You know what that word upbraideth not, that, that saying is, is meaning? He, he will not make you feel dumb. You ever ask that question and your teacher's like, seriously? Didn't we just talk about that for the last two hours? 
God doesn't do that. God says, oh, you want wisdom with this? Yes. You're going to claim the, you know, the promise I've given you in James 1? Absolutely. Here's the wisdom that you need to get through this temptation. And he'll do that. And he won't make you feel stupid. He's like, you've asked this 500 times now for this same temptation, and yet you're going to ask again? The Lord, the, when we have faith that he's going to do what he says he's going to do in his word, he blesses. Hebrews 11, 6 says, But with, without faith it's impossible to please him. For that he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is so crucial in our prayer life. Um, it, it, without it, it's going, it's going to hinder our prayer life if we don't have true faith when it comes to prayers. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we, and if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. He says we can have that faith. We can know if it's will, his will, we don't have these other things hindering our prayer life, and it's his will, we can be confident in our petition. And yet so often, I think we lack that faith that faith. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now I'm not, I'm not, once again, I'm not going with a name it and claim it style prayer life. But I, I do believe the Bible teaches that we need to have faith in our prayers. Uh, that we need to not just be, you know, talking to the ceiling, if you will, but Understand who we're talking to and have a faith that he has a desire to answer those prayers. All right, so we have um, a lack of salvation, unconfessed sin, uh, a lack of faith. Number four, wrong motives. Wrong motives. I believe this is one of the biggest hindrances in our prayer lives um, because of, not because of what we're asking, but because of why we're asking it. Uh, let's turn over to um, James. You're already in James. Turn over to James chapter 4. A couple pages over. James chapter 4. Then we're going to turn over to, Matthew, or to Luke here in a second. James chapter number 4, verse number 3 says, Ye ask, let's back up to verse number 1. Uh, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come uh, they not hence, even of the lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and ye have not. Ye kill, ye desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye war, or ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and ye receive not, because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. That verse right there, I think most Americans should learn. Um, you know, like when pastor tells the story about people coming in and asking him to pray with them over their lottery ticket. You know, just, just, just pray that the Lord will bless this. Uh, I'm going to give it to the church. I'm going to... The funny thing is, the people that pray that, they obviously have some money right now. Why don't you just give that to the church? Why don't you start with what you got and then, then see what happens after that? But... I'm not condoning playing. Don't say, Stephen, I gave all my money to the church, and then when bought a lot of ticket, I didn't win. I, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, so, but wrong motives is a, is a, big, a big hindrance in our prayers um, because we're, we're praying it for ourselves rather than for, the, for God's will. Turn over to Luke chapter 22. This is a very common passage of Scripture. Um, it's one of my favorite. Luke chapter 22. This is when Jesus is in the garden. He's praying. After the Last Supper. Let's read verse number, let's start in verse number 39. And he came out and went as he want, or he was wont, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, 
remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I think it is so, so important that we learn from this prayer of Jesus that it's not about our will. I don't know how to separate the will of Jesus Christ and the will of God. Don't ask me. I don't know how he separated that, but he says, if it will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, not my will as Jesus, but your will as the Father be done. That's too much for my little brain to comprehend. I don't get that. But the fact is, Jesus Christ was willing to set aside his own desires to make sure that the Father's will was done. Not, let me read it there. You guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. It says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So if Jesus Christ says, think about who Jesus is, and he says, my will, we're going to set it aside, God, your will will be done. How arrogant of us when we go to pray and say, God, you know, this is really what you should do. You know, like, I'm, like, I'm, just, not, I'm, just, I'm just saying, it's going to work out the best if this is how it works out, Lord. There, I've read so many things when it comes to, you know, the potter and the clay and um, talking about the fact that, you know, pottery doesn't tell the potter, like, hey, make me look like this. You're like, hey, I want to be a cup. Like, you know, potter's, pottery doesn't do that. It just kind of sits there and, you know, gets all mushed up and whatnot. A painting doesn't say, you know, hey, painter, before you start, I, I would really like to look like this. It has nothing to do with it. It just, it just does what the desire of the, the potter, the artist, whatever it may be, that's what the painting does. And with our prayer life, I think we shove our will into God and say, hey, 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 please do this. Hey, hey, hey this, this, is, this is what I want. Rather than saying, Lord, you know my heart's desire, but my true heart's desire is for you to be happy with my life. So whatever that is, that's what I want. And I think we miss out on that a lot, especially as Americans, because we can get so enamored with our stuff. It's just true. All right, so um, lack of salvation, unconfessed sin, um, um, wavering faith, wrong motives. Number five, when we try to impress others with our prayers. I don't think that happens too often these days, um, especially because most people don't even like to pray out loud. You know, if I were going to say, hey, can I have some volunteers to pray? Maybe, maybe five people would raise their hand or something like that. But it, it's not like most people are like, yeah, let me do it. Our Father. Like, not, not a lot of people are going to do that. But the fact is, that was a huge issue in the day of Jesus. Was it not? Turn over to, let me to my notes here. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 5. This is a very familiar portion of Scripture when Jesus is talking about prayer and he's rebuking the Pharisees for how they do it. And when thou prayest, chapter 6, verse number 5, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues. Um, where else are we? Oh, sorry. And in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. But not, or be ye not, sorry, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye need of, have need of before ye ask him. It says, don't be like the people that want to stand up and just pray so, they, so people think they sound good. It said, don't do that. That is wrong. It says, their reward, check. They just got it. There is nothing for them in heaven for the time that they're praying. Not at all. It says, go into your closet. Shut the door. And... It's not one of those, hey, I'm going to go pray for a couple hours, honey. So just, 
Just give me some time, okay? Just so you know what I'm doing. I'm just going to be over here. It's not, you're not trying to impress anybody. Hopefully, it's just you and the Lord spending time together. It's not even about how much we say or ask for. The, the fact is, I think we could just go to God, pray, and just praise his name. The Bible says he already knows what we need before we ask it. So we still ask for things, though. Isn't that funny? We still ask. Tonight, we're going to take up prayer requests. By the way, did you? Oh, look, my wife just came in with prayer requests. Good job, honey. There's some updates that we need to make on that, for the record. Um, remind me at the end. I was going to tell you we weren't going to have a, a prayer even this evening because I didn't plan on being up here this evening. But um, my wife's just amazing, isn't she? Isn't she amazing? Yeah, amen, amen, thank you. And so, I have no idea what I was saying. Look back at the notes here. Oh, in the closet. <laughs> and so, um, praying in, in, we still ask for things. But when it says that God already knows what we have need of, and yet we still, we still like to ask. But I really think we could go and sit for an hour and just praise God for who he is and for what he's done in our life. Lift him up for how great he is. And he'd still provide everything that we need. I, I don't have any lack of faith that he would do that. Because he is who he says he is. He's the God of the Bible that we read about, and his characteristic says that's what he's going to do. We still ask. We still ask. It, it tells us in you and James, if you have need of something, ask for it. So we ask. But the Lord already knows. So don't get mad if I accidentally leave something off the prayer list. Sorry. <laughs> All right, another thing. Another thing that will hinder our prayer life. Conflicts in relationships. Conflicts in relationships. Turn over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 3. How exciting is it that they will translate a verse of Scripture this week? Isn't that exciting? I'm so excited. Some, something that, that currently a language does not have, they're going to have in just a couple days. That's exciting. So I, when, when I can say, turn your Bibles to 1 Peter 3, and you can do it, that's, that's a blessing. The people in Bhutan can't say that. Soon. Soon. All right, 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 7. It says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to your wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker bethel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Finally, oh, sorry, we'll stop right there. Uh, that your prayers be not hindered. Husbands, <laughs> Wives, when we're at odds with each other, the Bible is very specific that that relationship, when you're at odds with one another, hinders your prayers. Your prayers are not as effective as they would be if you were cohesive with your wife, if you were at one with your wife rather than you know, distant due to whatever the argument may be. I promise you, whatever the argument is, is not worth you not being able to talk to God how you ought to be. Um, say you're sorry. Get over it. <laughs> but that's what I learned really fast. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Don't let a disagreement mess up your relationship with the relationship that matters the most in this life. No, don't get me wrong. Your relationship with your husband, your wife... It's way up there. But the Lord is, is above that, or it should be. I know it can be hard sometimes to put the Lord above your spouse, but it's something that the Bible commands us to do. And so don't have, don't have contention with your spouse and let it cause contention between you and the Lord. Mark eleven twenty five 25 says, And when ye stand praying, forgive... If ye have aught any against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. You ought to be forgiving to one another. Amen. Quick to forgive is a good way to live by. Um, quick, to, quick to bitterness is not a good way to live by. Quick to hold something in and, you know, I remember what they did to me. Yeah, they said sorry. They didn't mean it. It's going to hinder your prayer lives. 
Matthew 5, there's a couple of verses here, uh, verse number 21 through 24, says, ye, heard, uh, ye have heard that it was said of, by them of old time that thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger, um, I'm sorry, yeah, shall, shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever say thou fool shall be danger of danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thou have aught against thee, leave there there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Our relationship with each other matters. It, it, it matters. So yes, your spouses, your your brothers and sisters in Christ, don't. Don't have contentions because it's going to hinder your prayer life. Number seven. Number seven. An indifference to God's word. An indifference to God's word. Proverbs 28.9. Proverbs 28.9. I'm going to turn over there. The Bible says, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. As far as I know, that's the only time the phrase, the prayer shall be abomination, is used in the Bible. That's a pretty, that's a pretty harsh thing. You do a study on the word abomination, it's not like, you know, it's a small offense. It's awful. We could go through and look at different abominations in the Bible. We're not going to for time's sake, but and because I don't have them written down. Um, but to have our prayer be considered abomination. And he says, if you turn your ear away from this, if you know what the Bible says and you say, no, I don't want to hear that. I'm, I'm going to completely turn away from that. It says your prayer is abomination. God says, why, why are you talking to me if you're not going to let me talk to you? Right? We, we, that's what we say, right? We said, read the Bible. You know, that's what I learned in junior church. <laughs> read the Bible is God's talking to us, and prayer is us talking to him. You turn your, way, your ear away from his word, God says, why would I listen to you if you're not going to listen to me? Right. And indifference to God's word will hinder our prayer life. John 15, 7 says, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Anytime we see the word if, that tells us that it's conditional. Right? So back up to John 15, 7. If ye abide in me and my words in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Or done unto you. So if you don't, it won't. If you're going to live how you ought to live, you're going to keep my words in you, then you're going to come to the conclusion in Psalms where it says that the desire of my heart is really the Lord's desire. You're going to come to the same conclusion that Jesus came to that says, God, your will is what I actually want. You're going to come to that conclusion. And if so, the Lord's going to answer those prayers. He's going to answer a lot of times without you even asking. We'll read over and over in the Bible where prayers were asked, specific prayers, and they went along with God's will, and he did them. We don't know that he would have done them with, had you not asked, right? Um, but if you don't live a life where God's desire takes priority, you don't live a life where you're keeping your your unconfessed sin out of your heart. If you don't live a life like that, you, you, you live a life where you have contention with your spouse, our prayers are going to be hindered. It's conditional in, in, for, or in John 15 where we read that. Last point here. This one is very simple. We just don't do it. What's going to hinder your prayer life? Indifference to God's word, conflicts in relationship, lack of salvation, unconfessed sin, um, 
other points that I don't remember off the top of my head. Wrong motives, try to impress others with our prayers, wavering faith. And the last point is we just don't do it. Do we take time to pray? Do we set aside time each day that we say, you know, this is really just time for me and the Lord? I'm human. I understand that it's not easy. I understand that we get busy. Hunting is like my favorite time of year because I have no issues setting aside aside time to pray. You get me in a tree stand, I'll talk to the Lord for a couple hours. I'll enjoy it. But I tell you what, throughout the day, I mean, it's easy to get so busy. Wake up early, you know, get, get, get to work, you know, get, get working on things. And soon enough, you realize, ah, I didn't even stop to pray today. Don't think that just because I work at a church, I'm immune to the same thing that you're immune to. I promise you, I'm not. But not doing it's going to hinder our prayer life. We already read James 4, 2. It says, you lust and you have not, you kill, desire to have, cannot obtain, you fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. You just don't do it. Matthew 7, 7 and 8 says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and him that knocketh it shall be opened. So out of these eight things, what in your life is hindering your prayers? Maybe you have a perfect prayer life, and that's awesome. Don't do anything different. But maybe you're like me, and you find sometimes that when you pray, ah, I do have sin in my life. Or am I praying for the right reason right now? Do I put God's desires above my own every time that I ask him for something? Am I, am I praying like I ought to pray when I ought to pray? Let's go ahead and stand this evening. Mr. Star, if I could have you come to the piano. Or Luke, come up. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Mr. Star will play something on the piano. Very simple message this evening. But it's, it's words from this book. In my heart... I understand that people can present things uh, more charismatically or they can be more um, engaging. But in my opinion, when the Bible is opened and you're presented with the word of God, it ought to stir our hearts. And so if the Lord spoke to you about something this evening, as Miss Dar begins to play, you move forward. You, the altar is open this evening, as Pastor would say. You come pray to him. Just come talk to your father. You want to grab your hymnals, we'll turn to page number 220 and sing some of this together. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. Luke, lead us as we sing. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet heart of prayer. All right, you can look this way. Uh, we're done a couple minutes early.
And so the kids may or may not be up. It looks like some of them are. Uh, but there's prayer lists on the back if you'd like to go grab those. And like I said, we will make a couple updates to that list. Um, and then we'll join together for prayer time in just a moment.